Animals in your rental property can be a tricky subject, especially when it comes to emotional support animals. Today we have a little special guest. This is Phoenix. Say hello. Aww. He wants to go play now. But anyway, as a landlord, it's really important that all the rules and regulations of a rental property are followed closely. These restrictions are in place to prevent things like property damage, wear and tear, and general liability. However, there are some cases where the landlord might shift the rules in order to accommodate the law. One of those cases in which the landlord may need to negotiate with the tenant is an emotional support animal. Similar to service dogs, an emotional support animal provides a service to the tenant in form of emotional care. Both of these animals have different protections and rules surrounding them. Today, we're going to be going over everything a landlord needs to know about emotional support animals, including the consequences if the landlord does not comply. So what is an emotional support animal? An emotional support animal is a service animal that provides a service to the owner in the form of emotional care and companionship. This means that these service animals are not trained in any way to deal with a physical or mental impairment. Also, many people think of emotional support animals as being dogs or cats. However, emotional assistance animals can actually be any animal. Since there's no specific breed and weight restrictions to qualify, any animal can qualify as an emotional assistance animal. Some people also tend to confuse emotional support animals with service animals, so let's go over the differences. The main difference between the two is that an emotional support animal does not assist with any mental or physical disability. This means that it's not likely trained to do any specific job that the owner can't perform. In contrast, a service animal, typically a service dog, is seen legally as medical equipment that can perform specific services for the owner. These service animals are typically appointed by a licensed mental health professional and are trained to provide assistance to those with physical, mental, or emotional disabilities. They typically assist their owner in performing major life activities like navigating the house or retrieving items. Another important difference is that emotional support animals are only protected by the Fair Housing Act, the FHA. Service animals, however, are protected by both the FHA and the Americans with Disability Act, the ADA. So how do tenants qualify for having an emotional support animal? Although it's easy to define which animals qualify as support animals, it's a little more difficult to define which tenants qualify to have one. The most common cases are tenants who suffer from a diagnosed disorder or disability. These disorders can include learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, intellectual disabilities, attention deficit disorder, and a motor skills disorder. Support animals do not need any special training, but they still perform critical or life-saving services. But just because a tenant claims they have a disability doesn't mean that the landlord should believe them. Support and service animal laws state that an emotional support animal letter must be signed by a licensed mental health professional. This means that if the tenant does not have a signed letter, reasonable accommodation does not have to be made. So when can a landlord deny emotional support animals. Although it's really difficult to deny, say, an emotional support dog, there are some animals that can be comfortably denied. For example, wild, exotic, or disease-carrying animals do not qualify under emotional support guidelines. This means that landlords can deny reasonable accommodations to animals that can pose a threat to the general public. Also, there are some dog breeds that are restricted by pet policies, but these policies do not apply to emotional support animals. This means that virtually all domesticated dog and cat breeds qualify, and that's emphasis on the word domesticated. This means that a landlord can refuse to house animals like wolves or raccoons, for example. There are also some other reasons that a landlord may deny a reasonable accommodation request from a tenant, such as a tenant does not submit an emotional support animal letter. This is the quickest way to have an emotional support animal denied, and if the tenants cannot comply with this administrative burden, the landlord will likely deny the request. Another reason is if the tenant submits a fake emotional support animal letter. In some cases, tenants may try to submit a fake support animal letter to admit their pet into the property. This happens many times because due to restrictive laws, the landlord is limited to what they can ask about the disability or disorder. This means that it can be very tricky for landlords to spot fake documentation. Another good reason to deny an emotional support animal is that the animal is actually illegal in the state. Some examples of illegal animals include raccoons, skunks, porcupines, and hedgehogs. If a tenant has a letter for one of these animals, they can be safely denied housing. Another reason to deny housing an emotional support animal is it's destructive to the property. This typically happens after the pet has been admitted to the property. If the property managers or landlord sees that the pet is overly destructive, the pet can be kicked out. And lastly, the landlord can deny the tenant's pet housing
warning if the animal is too big or displays threatening behavior. For example, if a tenant is requesting to house a dangerous breed within the home, the landlord can respectfully deny the request. On that same note, if the tenant requests to house, say, an emotional support pony on the 25th floor of an apartment, they'll most likely be rejected. Even if the rules are very clear, there are still landlords that won't comply. So let's go over some of the consequences of not complying with these rules. So in some cases, landlords do have strict no pet policies at the rental property. And when this happens, there could be a large amount of dispute between both parties. The most important part is to make sure that both parties are communicating respectfully. It's also important that all communication and actions are on record in case of a lawsuit. If the tenant has already spoken to the landlord about their protections under the FHA, the landlord may still continue to deny the pet. In these cases, the landlord is subject to a lawsuit on the grounds of discrimination. This could be an extremely costly lawsuit for both the tenant and the landlord, especially if the landlord doesn't have discrimination insurance. Speaking of insurance, if you're a landlord and you want to learn more about types of insurance, then check out this video. I'll also have it linked in the description to learn all about the different types of insurance you may want. The tenant may file a formal complaint with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. This goes onto the landlord's record and is an undesirable outcome for all involved. Many states also have a government agency that investigates discrimination claims. The tenant can also complain directly to this agency, causing damage to the landlord's business and reputation. So in conclusion, just like with any other landlord-tenant interaction, it's important for both parties to have patience with each other. This could be a long and complicated process, but it requires commitment from both groups in order to make it work. And finally, be respectful to your tenants as the animal may mean more to them than what you think. Me and Phoenix were so happy to bring you this message. If it helped you out, make sure to hit subscribe, give this video a thumbs up, and we'll see you in the next one.